should we focus on self-love first or is that a selfish idea? I think self-love is, for many of us, it's something we have learned that is a selfish idea. I think many of us have learned that any focus on the self, having needs, having space to meet our needs, sometimes having you know, things that we're caring for, even when someone else does want or need something from us, support from us. And I very much am that person. Um, I spent very many years, decades even, putting the world before me. Um, I think the byproduct of that for a lot of us is we become increasingly resentful mm -hmm. when we don't have space to express whether it's our perspectives, our feelings, our wants or our needs. Um, over time, the the anger that builds up in that, I think, turns into resentment. Um, and at least my journey of that was projecting it outward, blaming the relationships I was in or the people around me, um, only to realize that it was my lack of creating that space for myself. and. As I often do, I like to talk about the science of things so I can make a case for the importance of self-focus. Because if we're not caring, especially for our physical body, um, if we're not taking care of those needs, actually when we think we're serving other people, we're actually operating quite selfishly. Really? Because when I think about self-love, I think about the concept of actually connecting to our organ, not to sound cliche, but our organ of love, of compassion, which is our heart. And if we're not in a calm, grounded state in our nervous system to even turn inwards, even attune to what it is that my heart wants me to do in any moment, while I might think I'm on the surface showing up in service of loving someone else, in reality, I'm probably just operating on some conditioned habits and patterns. So I think to build self-love means to build space for the self, mm. to recommit to caring for ourself so that over time we can actually attune uh, to our heart and be what I do think is intrinsically possible for each of us, being a compassionate, caring individual. And I think self-worth gets wrapped up in there too. The messages we send when we create space for ourselves, right, is for many of us unlearning this idea of being unworthy of having our needs met and actually beginning to create through action and lived experience the feeling, the embodied space of living in worthiness. This is interesting, you know, because I don't know if this is going to empower or upset some people watching or listening to this because I know, you know, my mom put everyone in front of her needs for decades. And finally, it's beautiful to watch her fully take care of her health first. Her, she's dance, she's tango dancing. She's doing knitting classes. She's doing all the activities that she wants to do for her for the first time, really fully owning it. And I notice her even being uncomfortable sometimes being like, oh, Am I doing too much for me? Cause I'm so used to doing everything for everyone else. And from my perspective, there are, there tends to be some women in the world who want to put everyone else's needs before theirs. And they've been doing this for years, or if not decades, and maybe they modeled this from someone that they saw it, or they got benefit from being that person in some way. But what I'm hearing you say is when we do that for a long period of time, there builds up a lot of resentment, anger, frustration and a lack of worthiness in ourselves if we're not working on self-love. Absolutely. And that, I think that habit, and I love that you're kind of even picking up on the identity um, that some of us have created out of this, you know, endless act of service. Mm -hmm. Or um, I talk about actually neurobiological, what I call conditioned selves, or literally these ways of being that become wired into our biology, our neural networks again, that originated at a time and a place. So to speak to your very beautiful point, right? What a lot of our parents, our caregivers, our you know, mothers in particular, um, likely were modeled was this maybe endless service or the way they had to safely and securely connect with whatever caregivers were available and whatever you know, access point they were available to them might've been to modify or to attune to someone else's wants or needs. So if you had that eruptive explosive parent, a lot of us gain safety by becoming so attuned or aware of what might cause that explosion. So if we can minimize, right, saying the things, doing the things, expressing the emotion that would cause that reactivity, right, we can gain safety in doing that. Um, same goes for if you had a parent like mine, which wasn't so, my mom wasn't so explosive with her emotions, but she was really disconnected with them. And it became clear to me 
the things that my mom would pay attention to me around, usually acts of achievement, and then the things that she would um, become disappointed and disconnect from me. So wow. whether it's what's modeled, this act of service, or what we had to do to attune to someone else, I think a lot of us begin to wear this identity. Um, it becomes not only who we are, it actually becomes neurobiologically how we feel the safest and the most familiar to ourselves. And I think that is then continuing to be in that cycle of giving, doing, and before we know it, it's at our own expense. What is the thing we need to heal first? The brain, the mind, or the heart? I think that the body um, plays such a larger role than we give it credit for, um, especially in my field. We like to praise the power of the mind, of the prefrontal cortex, our very empowered space that can imagine this incredibly different future and create all of this incredible change and even affirmations. I think that they're you know grounded in this reality that to think differently, we can create a shift, a shift in how we feel and ultimately a shift in how we do. And that's half of um, the journey, though the other half of it is really first attuning to what signals my body is sending my mind, um, my heart being included in that body. Um, specifically, what is my nervous system? Is my nervous system telling my mind that I'm safe in this moment, that I can be grounded maybe in that internal presence that we were just kind of talking about, right? Tuning inward, what is my heart saying? What is my heart wanting or what is my heart needing? What do I wanna to do to act in compassion in that moment? And if I don't feel safe in my body, and I know I spent decades with my body sending my, my mind, my brain signals of lacking safety, of threat, of endless stress. Your body was sending your brain this, or your mind my, this. My, my body was sending my brain this. I think this is why a lot of us, we, we can't sit in stillness. We feel endlessly distracted by the world around us or endlessly agitated because all of those are signals that our body is in, sh in stress ultimately. Staying committed that I am a separate individual even though I share my life with two other ones and continuing to be connected with me and my heart so that I can open and, and then there's that complicated aspect. Now I have two people to love me, right, to receive love from. There's still that wounded girl inside that feels so vulnerable asking 